Hello, my name is Renat Abdarstov and I'm presenting a system for efficient 3D printed stop motion face animation. My collaborators are Alec Jacobson and Karan Singh. And we are part of the DGP lab at the University of Toronto. Stop motion is a traditional animation technique that moves a physical object in small increments between photograph frames. When you play back the images consecutively, the objects or characters appear to move on their own. These days, stop motion animation is used in commercials, music videos, television shows, and feature films. However, the stop motion animation of the face is a very challenging task. The current state of the art solution is a technique called replacement animation, which involves the use of a 3D printed library of faces. That library is supposed to cover the expressive range of the character. During the recording process, the animator replaces the 3D printed faces on a frame by frame basis. Most studios design custom rigs to hold stop motion parts together in order to quickly swap between them. However, this approach comes with numerous challenges. First, it requires a large number of faces to be printed. For example, for the movie Coraline, made by the studio Leica, 15,000 faces needed to be printed for all characters. For their next movie, Paranorman, they printed 31,000 faces, and almost 9,000 faces were printed for the main character of Norman. Depending on what printer you have access to, the printing can take a very long time, and a lot of printers often fail due to printing errors. Printing thousands of faces is prohibitively expensive for amateur filmmakers. After printing is complete, additional post-processing may be required, including sanding down edges, smoothing inconsistencies, and hand-painting the 3D prints. It's not immediately clear how does one generate this library of faces in the first place, what expression should go into the library, and what should the size of the library be. If you initially digitally animated your face in Maya, for example, then you could 3D print every frame, but that leads to a lot of repetition, where the same expression is printed multiple times, and therefore a lot of material is wasted. It's also not clear how to assign a face from the library to a particular frame. One solution is to have a stop-motion animator sit down with a facial animation specialist who knows the face library inside and out, and they'll string together a series of faces that match the dialogue and the emotion. But ideally, you want to automate this process. In our research, we address the following problem. Given a computer animated sequence of faces and a printing budget, we output a library of replacement parts and a pre-frame assignment of the parts such that we maximally approximate the input animation while minimizing the amount of 3D printing and assembly. Our goal is to make sure that the resulting stop motion animation is perceptually as similar as possible to the input computer animation. So let's look at the overview of our system. Given the sequence of meshes and in our work we consider faces, we segment the meshes into multiple parts to amplify the expressive range of the face. We make sure that the boundaries between parts have minimal or zero deformation between them. This is inspired by the current practice in recent stop motion animated movies like Paranorman or Anomalisa, where they are also split the face in top and bottom parts and then either digitally remove the boundary or just leave it there as a part of aesthetics of the character. Then an optimal replacement library is computed independently for each part, and the face is assembled by interchangeably combining pieces from each part's library. And finally, we arrive at the stop motion animated version of the original input. Now let's look at every step of this pipeline in more detail. Mathematically, we can represent the input mesh animation sequence of n frames as a matrix where every column is a vector of stack vertex positions. We assume the mesh does not change topology, connectivity, or number of triangles during the animation. The user also specifies the desired number of parts denoted as S. You can see example of splitting a bunny face into two parts or the head of the horse into six parts. And last, the user specifies a desired size of the replacement library per part denoted as D. Many deformable objects like faces have a localized region of deformation separable by near rigid boundaries. Here's an example plot showing the heat map of the average displacement visualized over the average face. The red color indicates areas that deform a lot throughout the animation, and the white color indicates more rigid areas. Specifically for faces, as you see, it's common to segment a head into the upper and lower face across the eye area. So how do we achieve such segmentation? First, users can roughly indicate desired parts by specifying a seed triangle for each part. So here we choose two seed triangles, one is colored blue and another colored yellow. Our goal is then to assign every triangle in the mesh to some part. We can basically think of it as a labeling problem. The boundaries between part regions minimize an energy that penalizes cutting along edges that move significantly during the animation. 
The unknown here is a vector whose size is equal to the number of triangles, and each entry is a pair triangle part assignment. In this particular case, every triangle either belongs to the yellow part or the blue part. We formulate this energy as a sum of two terms. The unary data term penalizes parts from straying in distance from the input seeds. Specifically, it measures the geodesic distance from the triangle to the seed of the part it's been assigned to. In our example, the distance between triangle alpha to the yellow seed triangle is smaller than the distance to the blue seed triangle, and so the unary term will favor the triangle alpha to be assigned to the yellow part. The binary term considers every possible pair of triangles that share an edge. It penalizes cuts that pass through edges that have high displacement from their average position. The binary term is zero if both triangles alpha and beta belong to the same part. The term is not zero if triangles are assigned to different parts, in which case the edge between them becomes part of the boundary, and the value is equal to the displacement of the edge from their average position through the animation. For more details on unary binary term, please refer to the paper. This energy is efficiently minimized via graph cut based multilabel approach, for which existing implementations are available online. And the result is a per triangle labeling. For generic mesh, the part boundary may zigzag due to the necessity of following mesh edges. This is not only aesthetically disappointing but could be problematic since jagged boundaries will prevent 3D printed parts from fitting well due to printer inaccuracies. We smooth per triangle part boundaries by treating each part as an indicator function. This function is 1 if triangle alpha is in part J and 0 otherwise. We move each indicator function in a per vertex quantity by taking a triangle area weighted average of the triangle values. Treating each per vertex quantity as interpolated values of a piecewise linear function defined over the mesh, we mollify each segmentation function by a plus and smoothing. Because the input indicator functions partition unity, so will the output smooth functions. You can think of each function as a point wise vote for which part to belong to. Finally, the smooth part boundaries are extracted by meshing the curves that delineate changes in the maximum vote and assigning each possibly new triangle to the part with maximum value. We propagate this segmentation to all frames and denote this new mesh sequence as a matrix Y. Note that this meshing does not change the geometry of the surface, only adds new vertices along the edges. We now deform all frames of the segmented mesh sequence so that the geometry of the part boundaries stay constant across all frames. In other words, the position of the boundary vertices cannot change, it's fixed. We take the segmented meshes and the average mesh across all frames, and we want to find a new deformed meshes where the part boundaries of each frame are set to be the same as the part boundaries of the average mesh. In the continuous setting, we model this as a minimization of the squared Laplacian energy of the displacement field. Subject to constraints that displacements move each vertex along the boundaries to its average value across the input meshes and move non-boundary vertices smoothly. And we force the normal of the resulting meshes to vary consistently across the boundary. Please refer to the paper for the details on how to discretize this. Splitting the mesh into multiple parts and homogenizing the boundary between them allows us to freely mix and match different poses for each part while maintaining continuity across the part boundaries. This allows to magnify the expressive range that we can achieve while minimizing the amount of material needed for 3D printing. We now focus on determining the pieces that compose the replacement library of each part, and a pair animation frame assignment of pieces from these libraries to reconstruct the input mesh animation sequence faithfully. Given mesh animation of a single part, we want to find a replacement library of D pieces, which we represent as another matrix R, where every column are stack coordinates of the mesh representing a piece. And we want to find a sequence of n labels assigning each input frame to a corresponding piece from the library. To find this matrix R and vector L, we want to solve an energy minimization problem. The first term is a geometry term that tries to make sure the difference between the frame mesh and its corresponding library piece is as small as possible. Here, the matrix S is a d by n sparse matrix where ijth entry is 1 when piece i from the library matrix R is assigned to the frame j. So when you multiply our library matrix R by S, it basically creates a matrix where every column is a library piece for each corresponding frame. The second term is a velocity term. This term is very important because it tries to make sure that the difference between meshes in two consecutive frames is preserved as much as possible. All the matrices in this term are same as the ones in the geometry term except this new matrix G. 
Matrix G is a sparse matrix containing minus ones along the diagonal and ones below the diagonal. Multiplying by G computes the temporal difference between every consecutive frame in both the input animation and our stop motion approximation. To solve this optimization problem, we iteratively alternate between finding the optimal replacement library pieces while holding the labels fixed and finding the optimal labels while holding the library fixed. Finding the optimal library is simple and it ends up being a solution to a large sparse linear system of equations. Finding the library R and optimizing for labels L is more complicated, but no less well posed. We may rewrite our original objective function as a sum of unary terms involving the independent effect of each label on a frame F and binary terms involving the effect of pairs of labels corresponding to the neighboring frames F and G. This again is solved using graph cuts. Our optimization deterministically finds a local minimum given an initial guess. We those run multiple instances of our algorithm with random initial assignments and keep the best solution. Here we are showing a graph of a number of pieces needed to be 3D printed in order to stay below a certain per frame error threshold. We generate 10,000 frames of an animated phase reading chapters from the book Moby Dick. Given the labeling and the number of frames, we compute the minimum error value across every frame. As seen in the graph, the number of replacement parts increases rapidly until we reach about 5,000 frames. However, an additional 5,000 frames only leads to a small increase in library size, from 100 to about 115. Affirming that a reasonably small number of replacement heads can capture the entire expressive range of a character. We can modify our original energy to also account for saliency weights. Saliency weights guide optimization to better approximate small but perceptually important regions of deformation. The amount of deformation that happens in other larger regions of the face, like mouth for example, ends up taking priority over important regions like eyelids, which could potentially result in lack of blinking. Users can manually paint saliency weights, similar to skinning weights for articulated characters, in order to ensure eyelid movement is well approximated in stop motion library. The velocity term is critical in preserving the smoothness and correct timing of transitions between the meshes in the input. This is especially evident when the library size is much smaller than the number of frames being approximated. Absence of this term can result in both spatial popping and temporal sliding. Here we're showing the example of the popping effect where frames 740 and 741 in the original animation are similar to each other, but are much more different in our stop motion approximation, which leads to the unwanted popping effect. Most studios design custom rigs to hold stop motion parts together. For example, Leica uses magnets slotted into parts, which enable animators to quickly swap different parts during the filming process. Rather than assume a particular rig type, we did not focus on the generation of a connectors between parts. To realize our experiments, we simply created male-female plugs on parts that connect. These plugs can then be fused with the part and 3D printed. Here are some of the examples of 3D printed libraries. We recreated a typical low-budget stop-motion camera setup in our lab. We used a camera that is controlled by Stop Motion Pro Eclipse software to view the scene, capture still images, and mix store frames with the live view. Here are some of the segmentation results. Our method works on cartoon characters as well as high fidelity computer animation models. Here's an example where we demonstrate the generality of our segmentation with three and six parts. Increasing the number of parts allows to achieve comparable results while decreasing the number of pieces per part. Here are the printing results. Hello. I know you're expecting to see our film now. Well, um, there's been a slight, slight problem. Here are some additional results.
So this floating head walks into a bar, and the bartender says, Hey, buddy, what... <sighs> you, know, you know what? I, I don't have anything. This is... I really don't. I'm... If I had legs, I would leave. Will you get out of here? Will you? I'm trying to run an office here. Now, will you go to lunch? Go to lunch! Will you go to lunch? As mentioned before, the user can choose the size of the replacement library. Smaller size will be faster and cheaper to 3D print, but decreases the quality of the result. Our system is the first to address the technical problems of a stop-motion animation workflow and it has limitations subject to future work. Our segmentation approach does not respect the aesthetics of a part boundary. While our approach seamlessly connects different parts, the deformation, albeit minimal, can adversely impact geometric detail near the part boundary. Despite a seamless digital connection, seams between physical printed parts remain visible. Commercial animations often remove these seams digitally by image processing. But some directors like Charlie Kaufman have also made these seams part of the character aesthetic. Our replacement part algorithm results are based on a vertex position or deformation space distance metric. We believe our results could be better using a perceptually based distance metric between instances of a deformable object. Currently, our segmentation algorithm does not explicitly enforce symmetry. We want to thank NSERC and Canada Research Chair Program for their support as well as the DGP Lab. And we wanted to thank Sea Creature Productions for providing their behind the scenes clips that you saw at the start of this presentation. Thank you for watching our talk.